And we're back with uh, data structures. So let's go structure some data. No, um, <laughs> I don't know. No, I think I created a poll. Let me let me launch the poll. poll. <laughs> William, I saw a video of one uh, guy. I don't know if you know him, like Joma. <laughs> He's called Joma, the developer in YouTube. And he makes a video saying like, why is word the absolute best editor you can use for it you know like it is a very really, really funny video on that that reminds me the reason why i started using site a long time ago was there's an editor there's a, a video on youtube where this guy and it's like watching either isaiah or maestriath right with their tools that they're like um use site for auto hotkey and just dazzle how simply he was manipulating text and doing stuff and it's just it's so fun watching people who really have gotten solid you know with their editor uh, married them so to speak right <laughs> it's crazy how powerful it is Indeed. so that here it's interesting actually and 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 yeah there you go like it is clear certain details about this i'm really surprised xml is not in there at all i i would vote for XML overall at first. I, I know with Chad, we we did so much stuff with his XML class. Um, but in our testings with XML, when we had over, I forget, Chad, do you remember? Um, are you still there? Maybe I'm here. Oh, okay. Eh, Cierrame la puerta, no. Que it, tenga. Um, Yo pedí algo del colmado. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Mute Man. <laughs> oh, I thought that I... <laughs> Uh, anyway. I thought that I'm muted by say I actually turned off the camera only. <laughs> right. No, no worries. Okay. Years ago, Chad and I, when we first started playing with SQL, um, we we said, well, let's do, and we had Jean Lon, who's, uh, is Jean still here? Yeah, he's still here. He he gave us an introduction to it. And then later he led a webinar on using SQLite, uh, which was awesome. But we, um, Chad had this XML class for storing stuff. And so we said, well, you know, SQL is amazingly fast, but amazingly powerful. Um, and XML, because it's structured, not like JSON, it's structured data, it also can be fast, but at some point it starts bogging down when you have too much data. So do you remember, Chad, like was it around the 20,000 points where suddenly with XML, we had problems with it? Oh yeah, the the uh, performance in XML is horrible once you get past, I, I would say maybe a couple hundred megs. It's just unusable. No, wow. Yeah. So the reason why is because XML is was meant just to share information between one computer and the other over the internet. So you see those HTML requests that we usually do? The XML was supposed to streamline that, that you can send one line right, which the XML query or data between, you know what we do with JSON strings right now between, you know, the API calls, that's what XML was meant for. Not for storing really data in your computer, but as it was a structured uh, uh, language, well, not language, but structured query thing, um, people started using it like that. But as soon as you hit this huge database, the engine that is supposed to read this it's not meant for large data. That's where it breaks. That's what happens. No, yeah. I use it mostly for saving settings for programs that I write or something like that. It's wonderful for that because yep. of the structured uh, nature of it and just the ease of which you can re, um, recall the data in a structured form and with you know minimal effort, write a couple of little classes and it just dumps everything back in a auto hotkey object and then you're good to go and right. you've got all your data one call to uh, one xml call you've got everything that you need and it's wonderful but yeah. unfortunately once you get into big data it's just it's impossible to uh, the performance hit is just unbelievable Way too big no yeah that, that's right now uh, i see here uh, basically what i saw here is that most people use either any files or CSV files, and third would be JSON files, and then lastly would be SQL databases. Now, I, I'm really surprised that nobody uses the Windows registry. Do you know that the Windows registry is like a database? <laughs> it actually, is a database. It yeah. is the database. That's actually your computer that all 
information regarding your computer is stored in the Windows registry. So basically it is one way of storing data in a more sometimes secure way. People don't like it because when I uninstall my program, I would like it to remove the information from the registry. Not all though that, but um, Dimitri was mentioning, oh, he doesn't like to use CSV files. Uh, if you're using CSV files, I, it is really recommended to use tab delimited files instead of comma delimited files because the CSV files with the comas have the issue that he was describing between America and Europe. Oh, and even then, there's just, you know, tabs are not very common in text files, right? Whereas a comma is very, you know, prevalent. So if your file doesn't get escaped properly, that comma throws havoc, right? Yes. Like, I don't understand who picked comma is... <laughs> Use a pipe, use some sort of Unicode character. Nowadays, use a Unicode character, right? Right, anything that is not a comma, please. <laughs> so, yeah, now, now here's the thing. Uh, somebody was asking about what is the advantage of using any files. Basically, so long as you have uh, key value pairs, like you have an option and the setting for that option, and any file is great, it's fast, it's simple. You have built-in tools to deal with it and they can be modified easily in any editor. So usually any files are a very quick way to have information, you know, like um, save things very quickly. But as soon as you have kind of like hierarchies of settings, any files are gonna be a nightmare to work with. So if it is just plain, like just one key, one value, that's okay. But if one key can have kind of like a hierarchy of other key value pairs, then that's not going to work. You but know, Isaiah is actually, and, and, and it's funny, I'm glad Chad's here because I, I know you do this too, Isaiah, but um, from watching Chad build list views and stuff with XML, like the two can be very mirroring each other, right? Oh, tree okay. views, yeah. Yeah. So if you're if you're working with the tree view, man, XML is amazing to to yeah. store your data. That is right. Or, or a JSON because JSON and so here's the other thing between why why everybody uses JSON instead of XML when they do basically the same thing. The thing is that for XMLs you require many times the amount of data that you want to store. So if you want to store the word cat and you want to put some, you have to put some tags around it. Each of those tags have a lot of characters that you have to add and the brackets, right? When in JSON, you have the word cat and now you just have two brackets, nothing else. And so the amount of text that you're storing in the string is less, it's way less. So that's the reason why people are using JSON strings. I would definitely think that I could build the same tree view structure using a JSON file instead of an XML, but it would be kind of like um, basically like you could use the same for both. I like Descalada's, uh, it's a poop delimited list. That's, <laughs> that's, um, that is, I think he got something there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, sir. All right, so so I want to I want to make a comment about the comparison you made with XML. Um, the, there are a lot of people who do XML um, maybe incorrectly. So yes, there is a, a little bit more overhead, but um, there's also um, less of the so-called tag problem if we are. Um, um, using attributes properly. Mm -hmm. Oh, so right, it's true. So, it's true. so it's just a an, a an attribute. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, so um, I mean, there's a time and a place to wrap something uh, with opening and closing tags, but most of the time, you know, th there's there's this needless creation of excess overhead with. Um, Tags that could have been properties in an XML. Yes. Yeah. 100% um, agree. 
So I, I just want to, that's kind of a caveat. And, and I, I saw the comment about um, graphing, you know, for every tool where there is something to uh, uh, build um, charts and things, there, there's also one for XML too. Um, uh, AlterX, Tableau, uh, 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 wow, what's the other one? But, it's Microsoft's, I can't remember. Um, uh, all will import and use XML freely for yeah. all of the Power BI. Power BI, that's what I was yeah. thinking of. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, and so they'll they'll all they'll all consume that just as well. Um, so from that standpoint, there's probably not a, a, a lot of difference there. JSON is also more popular because it's better supported it's in JavaScript. So and um, so that makes a much more. Um, you know, when you encourage the use of something by web developers, it tends to become more popular everywhere. Uh, Isaiah, I think you're uh, muted. Now it is interesting that we can actually say that uh, I saw one of them saying, like, when I serialize an object model to JSON, I can understand it. Now, you have to understand that the JSON strings are a way specifically to use object notation. So it is meant specifically to describe an object in a very quick manner. Um, so that's the reason why it easy is it, it makes it easy for you to understand um, to to serialize an object model in that particular format. As soon as yeah. you try to use another format that it was not meant for that, it it is of course more difficult. I I, I can, cannot think about creating you know serializing an object into you know a SQL database or something like that. It would be a little bit more of a of a problem. Yeah. That's yeah. that's false. just that your XML is not the tool for that. That would be right. And, and in fact, if you look at uh, an ECMAScript based class definition, you will notice that it is um, in, in almost every way a conform, a, 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 a conform to uh, JSON standard, uh, except that uh, these are functions that you're defining as um, as uh, elements instead of text. Right. Now, there is one thing. Many people like JSON, but it is not that JSON is better at certain things than everybody else. There are situations when using JSON strings is not the best. And one one quick thing that I could think about is like the, the same with XML. As soon as you have tons of data, Let's say that you have megabytes of data. Parsing through that data is going to be a little bit more complicated with JSON, even though it might be quick, but it will reach limit. That's when we then switch to a database structure like C SQL, uh, MySQL, um, uh, SQLite, or stuff like that, which are compiled databases that grab your data, make it into machine code so that ma the machine can read it faster. And you know, you just say like indexes are magical, dude. Whenever you have an index, that's instantaneous. Anything you do is instantaneous. You do not have to even search for stuff; it just finds it. So, compiled databases are the go-to in two situations. One, you need speed. For example, you have millions of rows, and I could even show you. That I have a SQL database, like a SQL database over there that has how many rows was it like 7 million rows and you double click it and it reads it right away, right? That's what it's for, for reading fast data. And second, when you have multiple users or multiple programs accessing the same information, usually using a database like MySQL or you know other types of databases would work better in that situation. 
Azaleas, let me interrupt you just for a second, because, and I don't know if this is the one you're referring to, but if you recall, I have that file, it is like 1.5 gigabytes, right? It's a JSON file. Um, the interesting about it is each line is its own self-enclosed JSON string. And so we wrote a program in AutoHotKey to loop over it and um, process it and then convert it into a SQL database, which is what, like you said, it should have been, right? I, I don't know who thought this one up. Maybe because it just gives a plain text file and then you don't, you're not dependent upon a given, you know, database type structure, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, well, yeah, go ahead. So, so there's, there's a whole another element to this. And, and, and again, um, what we haven't mentioned here is that there's a huge difference between structured and unstructured data. Um, so whether we're talking about JSON, XML, or MySQL, My, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, whatever, we're all, we're always talking about structured data. When we're talking about things that aren't structured, we have to uh, explore topics like NoSQL implementations, like Mongo. Yep, that's right. So now here's the thing. MongoDB, it has the flexibility, right? Because it's kind of like JSON strings, but those JSON strings are not really clear text, if I remember correctly. They are actually transpiled somehow because again, the, the, some people like Mondo because of the flexibility, because in a normal SQL database, you cannot just remove a column easily. You, if you remove a column, you will have to change the database structure and it would be a little bit annoying. In MondoDB, you don't have that issue because as, as it is kind of like using JSON, it is very easy to modify the database very quickly on the fly and it will not, it will not well, no, I mean, it, it's not even, it's not even JSON. So like these can be flat text files spread across a file system, whatever. The, the point of, of these implementations is that they will go through and uh, pull the data area and create indexing automatically so that when you query against it, it knows where to look for the data you're wanting. That, that's the nature of what NoSQL implementations do. It's that these these can be in almost any readable text format whatsoever. Um, I mean, it could be a flat text file. My, you know, the diary of Mark Twain. <laughs> it could be anything. No, but here's the thing. When, what would be the difference between a plain text file and a compiled database like, like when uh sql grabs your data it compiles it into machine code there's one of them so mondo db i don't know i don't know i cannot actually comment on which one is faster or not because i don't know about that but i think people what they use to compare the two is in some case in, in this case flexibility of MongoDB, which is a little bit more flexible than a normal database, but a normal database would then would have the speed advantage. And what they say is like, when you are deciding whether to use one or the other, you would have to take into consideration the trade-offs. And I would say like for a text file, because if, if, if there was no difference, as you mentioned, between you know a plain text file and a compiled database, then I would just use CSV files. Right, but there is, I think there might be a difference, even for MondoDB, even if they have plain text files. So, on so, the, on the sense of, you know, there might be a trade off in speed than yeah, overhead. Yeah. So, these NoSQL implementations typically cache the data. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so there's some memory overhead. Right. Uh, in, in loading it into memory. Uh, but the indexing allows them to have addresses for things that where it finds uh, cardinality in the data. Right, exactly. Uh, and the concept of cardinality, of course, is the same thing that we use for indexing in a structured database. It's how do we identify individual unique pieces of data? Um, Very quickly. 
<laughs> and, and so so there, there's a lot that's been done to make up for the speed differences with these NoSQL implementations. But again, the big difference here is your, your NoSQL implementations are, are well suited for unstructured and large data sets, right? Massive data sets um, that may not be structured or may not be organized. Um, and and I would I would argue that you will have a hard time finding an, a well educated uh, uh, database expert who would suggest a NoSQL implementation um, in any situation where your data is already well structured. No, no, no. I wouldn't I wouldn't actually say that either. So so basically, I wouldn't say like no. Uh, you can. It's it's the same as with every single type of tools. There are tools that are better at one thing and in a very specific situation than others. If I have uh, data that is coming in that sometimes I have people that might have the name um, but not have the last name and would have a phone number and not an address, but sometimes they would. Over there. Yeah. Then using a database that is flexible enough to actually store the data without those columns and not use that space is better than having a database that is kind of like fixed on a specific size. And if that data wasn't provided, I'm going to put a null in it. You know, that's different, you know? Which yeah. also brings up another really critical point, right? What type of data are you storing? Because yeah. some things can handle, you know, um, bitmap, you know, pictures and, and binary data. And, you know, it just depends what you're going to do, right? What, what you have to store. And how do you escape certain characters, right? Or do you have to? Do you have to encode it in some way? And yeah, this is a very important topic. Whenever you're dealing with data, whenever you're dealing with data and storing the data in any kind of structure, you have to clean your data before you store it. What does that mean? For example, if you have an ini file, you know that the ini files are structured with a key, an equal sign, and a value, right? That means that your value should not contain an equal sign because the equal sign has a special meaning. So whenever you're storing your information, uh, 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 I want to I want to kind of correct you there because yep. the, the standard for any means only the first equal sign matters. Well, that's the thing. I, I ran into an issue uh, with any files, and I was I, I don't know how that issue came to be because I, I had the same understanding as you do. You have multi line uh, data. No, well, no, it was not multi line, but the, I was saving a 64, uh, so the base 64 encoded string. And you know that the, sometimes the string has these equal signs at the end for some reason. Sometimes I remember this now. Yeah. Right. So, so we were having an issue that when I was reading the ini file, uh, those equal signs were being ignored. And then my string was not working. I, I yeah. cannot remember exactly what the details were of the error or whatever was happening. But as soon as I started just grabbing the, the, the uh, equal signs and just converting them, I didn't have the issue anymore. But I'm saying like, in general, it's a good approach. If you're saving information in a SQLite database, if that information contains single quotes, it's good for you to escape those before you store it into your SQL database. Well, uh, and that and that's true of other database systems too. For yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm, 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 that's that's my point. It is in general. Slashes have special meanings. Yep, um, exactly. So that's exactly what I'm referring to. What I'm saying is that usually whenever you're going to save your data, you have to make sure that that data is clean. It doesn't matter which type of databases. I just made the the example of the ini file because it's the easiest one to understand. Because as you mentioned, SQL has many special characters. In ini yep. files, there's not that many. But yep. my, the point is the same. It's just that make sure whenever you're going to save information into a value, into a database, clean it before you save it because you're going to have a few interesting problems. Remember the, the thing we ran into yes. the other day, Isaias, with the, the formatting of the, the text in the any file that, like, it didn't, it, it doesn't have a format command for the any, for the encoding of the file. Is that what it was? Remember? Uh, 
Yeah, so the, the um, what's the file encoding that it was not being able to read it? Well, because my main Arhat script and the ini file were in different formats, right? Um, yeah, those kind of things happen. Um, and again, I think Anthony down here mentioned, put the name on it, is data normalization. <laughs> I think they got really. <laughs> That's awesome. That'll be the yeah. high point of the day. <laughs> they got a little bit excited about data information and stuff. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they got really excited about that one. <laughs> they wanted to chime in, right? <laughs> now, data normalization usually is not really about cleaning the data about, um, well, you know. See, that's you know, sometimes that's, it is. Cleaning is an ambiguous word, right? Yeah. Cleaning yeah. in the sense of you think of it like an address. Oh, I, every time it's dr for the people in the states here. I, you know, every time it's drive, I'm going to have the same thing. Like it's going to be dr period, right? That's typically standardization where you're, you're applying it and keeping it in a consistent format. Um, but the, the thing is, some people would definitely refer to that as cleaning. Right. Yeah. But but yeah, in this case. I think there's another way of calling it, which is escaping, you know, or encoding, which is that you can grab those type of characters and convert them into something else that does not conflict with what they mean, which is encoding or escaping them using the escape uh, uh, commands that are given to you. Like, for example, if you have the, the in SQL, if you have the single quotes, you have to put two single quotes to escape them, for example. Um, let's see, go ahead. Yep. Sorry, sorry about that, guys. Uh, the dogs. <laughs> um, well, I, I was, I was gonna, uh, I was gonna hear the uh, uh, or, or bring up the difference between sanitizing and cleansing as part of this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. You know, cleansing is removing things that don't belong. And sanitizing is making it safe for storage. Um, Chad, I don't, you've been doing some amazing stuff here. Why don't you go ahead and give us a quick review of? I'm sorry, can I repeat that? I was saying for Chad, he's been sharing a screen here um, <laughs> and demonstrating some stuff. I just thought it was now was a good chance to, for him to explain what he's working on. Hopefully, he can hear us. Oh, I can't. I muted. Well, all right, then you're screwed. No, I'm kidding. Let me find you. Uh... <laughs> I don't see you in the list. There, okay, weird. I don't know why. Okay, well, there we go. Can you unmute yourself now? Did you, you must have left and come back maybe? You should um, had a blue screen issue. Oh. Yeah, just um, with, XML, it's wonderful for like tree views and stuff like that. Just the structure is so wonderful with just a very little bit of code. You can see that I just created two different branches within an XML structure and then looped over them and brought them in and used the XML structure to then store the tree view values for each of those nodes so that you can then reference back to them to get the, the parent-child um, relationship. Relationship, thank you. Yeah. And build a tree view with very little effort at all. And you can see the, the XML now, over here. Good question. And uh, is, this is a question for anybody who has worked with data before. Is it easy to flatten a parent-child relationship into a one-liner? Is it easy to do in, in like, can you express a parent-child relationship between nodes in one line <laughs> instead of actually having a tree? Oh, so, it's possible. It's just, I don't know. I, I think less elegant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with the less elegant, but like um, uh, the, the white space of uh, 
approach, yeah. It's stored, you know, new lines and spaces and tabs are completely unnecessary. Oh, I agree, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I see, can... that, that's YAML, right? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it, it, it makes it nicer to read, but just like JSON, you can get it all in one line and it doesn't change how it's read. Right. At all. Yeah, without doing the transform, it's just to make it human readable. It, it all just gets squished. Gets there, there's, there, there's another benefit to XML that I, I, I left out, um, and I know we're, we're late in our conversation here, but um, the, the, there's a whole web standard around uh, being able to build transformative interfaces um, using queries and building your content um, to XML called XSLT. Um, and uh, where your web server will simply pull, do execute the queries against your XML and display just what the query is. And so it's read as server side code and rendered as plain HTML. Yeah. yeah, I've seen that done before as well. It's pretty cool. Actually, and now that we're talking about that, it just dawned on me that you see, uh, YAML uses tabs for kind of like delimiting the, the, the parent-like structure. If I change the tab to any character, let's say a dot, <laughs> I could use that to flatten it. So in an E file, I can conserve a tree view by putting one dot, the name of the node. That means that it's on the first, you know, on the, it's a parent. And then you put two nodes but then you lose which one belongs to which one <laughs> right yeah you need uh, the you need some sort of identifier yeah yeah i mean qap uses any files and he has them structured right on the saving of of your information exactly right. he yeah, also well, light as well though <laughs> yeah. uh, which brings up a whole different conversation Right, uh, and, and maybe it's a topic for another meet one day, but you know, um, the, the, there's a concept in programming uh, that's uh, called abstraction. Yes. And, and basically what it means is, just because you have all these low level functions, um, you probably shouldn't be using them directly. You probably need to wrap them and, and for, for like the ending file, right? Why would you ever worry about every time you implement uh, writing something to an NI, any file, whether or not you're going to sanitize it? You have a function that automatically does all of the things that you're going to want to do to your data before you write to an any. Right. Right. And, and so this, this, this idea of code abstraction, um, just because we can deal with everything at a low level, doesn't mean we should. Right. And actually, you just named what I was, what I meant by cleaning. It's not really cleaning, it's sanitizing, uh, sanitizing the data. You're actually making it good to be in the database. Uh, it's yep. not gonna break the database, by the way. Safe for storage. Now, what I would so, say, what I would suggest for anybody who is wondering, okay, so there's a lot of data structures. What should I use? Um, what I would say is that it depends on what you're trying to do. And it, the answer <laughs> for anything you're doing, it doesn't matter what it is. It depends. Is it depends. Uh, if you are just saving options for a program and each option is just a key value pair, Anini is going to be more than enough, right? You're not, you don't have to make it more complex than that. As soon as you need speed, the ini is going to work fine for small files, but as soon as you start having thousands and millions of data rows, um, I think it's better to use certain types of databases. But if what you need is flexibility, then a JSON string or a JSON database like MondoDB might help you way better achieve what you're looking for while still giving you the speed. So again, it usually depends on what you're trying to do. I would go most of the time, if you're saving settings, any files, JSON strings, CSVs, that works perfectly fine. If it is just information about people, CSVs, you know, and again, databases of 
SQLite, MySQL, that would be a little bit better. Oh, or, you know, there's a couple other things, though. I think, you know, as we mentioned earlier, the type of data you're going to save, right, matters. If your data has a lot of relational tables where sometimes there's a couple, you know, columns, sometimes there's dozens, that's where a database is great for doing that. Um, you can also use ADO to read, store your data file as text files, but then read it and use SQL, right, without actually having a database. Um, there's there's lots. And then one more, which we didn't, which, which with Maestri with uh, Chad, we ran into was, hey, we were going to have, we created a database. It had to be fast. Great. Okay. Database works great. We're storing images. Great. Database works great. Okay. It's going to be on a network. Still works great. Okay. Multiple people are going to be reading and writing at the same time to this thing. And then, that was where yeah. SQL. <laughs> <laughs> like that's where Joe died. Actually, my yeah. SQL you know, becomes an option where it has a queue that is automatically managed, if I remember. That is right. And and Eugene actually uh, brought up a good question. With storing up the user data in SQL, does that mean that it's possible for me to store license keys in a cloud-hosted DB and have programs I create uh, be licensed using the license keys in the database? Of course, that's basically the main idea. Right now, uh, most, so a uh, few years back, most programs like, Photoshop and stuff like that, they had their own, you know, the, the key stored in the computer until, as we mentioned at the beginning, somebody with enough motivation hacked the way how they did it. Oh, so we're going to use a different, you know, module obfuscated and make it so hard to understand. They figured it out. And then they decided, you know what? The database is not going to be in your computer. It's going to be in my server, <laughs> which I have full control and you have no access to it. So your license keys are going to be checked against our uh, 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 you know, server that even though it is a nice solution, again, somebody with enough uh, drive will go around that. They just block the programs from connecting to your server and then fake it in one way or another in a way that it supposedly has a key stored. So again, yes, I would definitely say that's a better solution, having the license keys on a server that you control, not the user. But there are ways around that, that people, if they have enough interest, they will find out about it. But uh, I think in one post, Joe, I, I was on the forums yesterday uh, and I saw a, a post that you had about protecting intellectual property and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And people were commenting about that. And somebody made a very good point. Look, of the 100% of users that are going to use your software, 80% of them have no knowledge about how to mess with it. So that's okay. They're not going to mess with your program. About that, about that, from that percentage, you, you might have an additional 10% that know what they're doing. They're going to try to hack it. But if you put enough uh, you know, things in it to make it difficult, they're going to let go of that because they don't have the drive or time to do it. About the next 5% are people who have the drive, have the knowledge, but they're law-abiding citizens. They say, hey, I just pay you the five bucks and that's it. I just don't deal with it. Then there's this 5% that it doesn't matter what you do. They're going to find a way around it. But again, it's just 5%. Probably well, yes. More importantly, like you said, no matter what you do. It right? doesn't matter so what you why, do. So why bother? You know. <laughs> Down so down. what I would say in general, put enough stuff to discourage about 95% of people and you're good to go. The, the, the amount of money or amount of revenue or amount of uh, users that you're going to lose is too small to actually even matter. But again, don't stop doing that. Yes, use a database that is cloud hosted, have your licenses there, have your script, send a query, and then just... Um, um, Check on that. Yeah, that's another. Alan made a very good point. Just make some of the options of your program server side in a way that it wouldn't work if it didn't connect to the server. Those are, you know, mechanisms that make your program a little bit less hackable. But in the end, somebody's going to find a way. Somebody, if they decompile the code or just look at the assembly code, they might switch the code a little bit so that it doesn't make the check whether it is being ran from the server or not. And it would just go ahead and execute it anyway. So yeah, those kind of things.
yeah the um the list is endless but as far as the data goes uh it, it, you know i mean a lot of a lot of businesses that we we talk to they of course have their 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 database in an excel file right and i can't tell you how insane that is and yet how common it is um, actually we had a project just the other day is that remember where the lady they were they wanted to update had done this bidding project in excel and they were they they went and updated the first tab and expected <laughs> it to magically propagate throughout the rest of the spreadsheet but none of it was linked there was no look up right. and so they were scratching their heads at how to fix it and uh anyway we ought we fixed it for them but um it's just amazing how people incorrectly use technology and here's the thing no matter what you do there's always different pros and cons to whatever you come up with right there's no right answer i mean there's yeah. sometimes there's some very good answers but don't worry too much about it like you you can look for the more the most optimized solution but there there will always be some things and as you said like it's not to fully secure the program that's totally fine then. But I, I would really suggest having the licenses outside of the user's control. Most of the time, programs go ahead and obfuscate it, add it into the registry or something like that until somebody like me comes around and I check what the program is actually writing to in the registry and I just go ahead and look for it. That's it. So <laughs> then again, uh, don't do it locally. Just go ahead and make it online as you're thinking and that would be better it's a better approach it, most of the programs that's what they're doing right now they just have a an online database that they check against yeah um that's kind of been the point of the subscription model that has come about in the past decade or so is to just pay, charge people for the usage not for the purchase Right, no, because there's no point. You you know that you can't fully protect any piece of software anymore, and even Microsoft has just bent a knee to this subject. You don't. Yes. <laughs> well, I would even alter their uh, think is to em they've embraced it and said let's let's figure out a way where we can monetize this and actually make even more money. Right. Where <laughs> part of it is, part of it is a subscription based thing right where you're slow let people a lower a subscription based monthly fees as much as i hate subscription fees it also reduces the cost per item so i can try it i can do it for a little bit right but it stays up to date so i always have the most recent version of it right there's some good pros to it as well that's right right and and you can see where your user base is actually um interested in features and functions but uh the you know the, there's a there's another side to this because micro when i say microsoft bent at me because microsoft was one of the last great holdouts on software ownership yes and, and fine and they finally gave up like they even opened um uh, open standard office product documents right the the the, the open xml standard that is used in office since 2007 um was part of them just realizing, hey, you know, there's there's no amount of encryption compiling, whatever that's really going to protect it. We might as well. And just, might as well just, yeah, exactly. Just just embrace <laughs> Make the best of it, yeah. <laughs> um, and and so and so they have, and and you know they started uh, building in um, their biggest competition, Linux. They started. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> uh, actively and uh, openly supporting it um, and endorsing it and embracing it. Um, but but there's there's another component here that, that that we seem to always forget about when we're talking about speed and metadata and settings. You know, there, there's one thing to the whole licensing and authentication. Yeah, you should always have that external, right? But then there's some stuff that. You, you don't need to and and your answers to that are cookies and registry yeah uh, you know i mean we're, if we're talking about user preferences save yourself the overhead and make that store locally um it's easy it's fast and and there's no point there, there's no point in exporting it to store it somewhere else or including some technology that's not native to the os um, it's just not necessary and it doesn't help. That is right. I would agree with that. 
um, most of the times we, we have embraced that just because um, it seems to give a little bit more control. But as you know, Mage just said, all the top subscriptions programs like Adobe have, ha they have been cracked. If they have a way to do it, they will do it. <laughs> they every time will do it. There is no way, you, you cannot escape that. But again, how many people crack that? Well, it's just probably a 1%. That's basically one to 5% of people who can actually take the time and have the patience to do it and have the resources to just spend their whole days trying to figure it out until they do. That's how it is. Yep. I think uh, we got a lot of a lot of information about That's every awesome. single one of the yeah uh, every single one of the topics here. I, I think we, we we can launch the poll about what the, what they like what they like and they didn't like. Uh, we I didn't make. I mean, oh right. I'm not worried about that. I, I'll do when I send out the links to the recordings. Um, I'll I'll probably put them there about what what because the problem is I can only have a list of things to select from. What I'd love, really want to know, and I, I mean, you can type it in here. It's just, what should we have covered? We didn't cover, like what, how do you wish we had had on here today? Um, did you want, we talked about whether we were going to do a lot of lecturing and actually sharing of code, but we thought we can always do videos and sharing how to do something. It's having a discussion with different experts is um, what this day should have been about. Um, it looks like Chad's got one more thing here. He's going to demonstrate, but. Yeah, if anyone has any other thoughts on if you want to chime in here, but or just answer in the quiz if I send you um to say what you know or write me an email just saying this is what I wish we had covered. Just remember we had to pick from a list of you know, we had a lot of items to to review and had to cram it into one day. And so <laughs> we got yeah. So, so I, 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 I'll just type in here with one last thing and, and then I gotta uh bail out for a while too, but you know, the, the, there's a common theme here amongst the folks who have done any of this kind of work for a while. And, and I really think everybody gets lost on um, this, this initial question, which one should I learn? Which one should I do first? And the answer to that question is always, it, it always comes out as that depends. But the real and better answer is take a look at them, do some experimentation, Find one that seems to make sense to you as you're learning it and build on that. You can add other languages, other structures as you go along, but you've got to start with what feels good at first and then build your skill set. Don't worry about this idea of what's better because if it works, it's the right answer. Right. Hey, yeah. I have two questions. One is, in your picture, you're muted. So I don't know how I can hear you. But anyway, um, the only thing I would add to what you just said is, hey, find someone who's actually worked in these things and ask that if they're an expert, ask them, hey, this is what I'm trying to do, right? Like, which one do you recommend? But I still agree with you. If you're going to be developing and maintaining the code, you, you have to be knowledgeable of it, right? That doesn't, it doesn't mean you can get around that. But um, what I would actually... I kind of like insert into what he just said is find the one that is most simple first start with the simple ones get a feel for them and when you hit the point that you say well this one doesn't work because of x then switch to a more complex one because the problem is that sometimes you can very quickly do fix things with a simple solution and that works just fine it might happen so well yeah, but it, I, I see. I just disagree with that in the sense of, hey, who who are you working for? Someone else or for yourself? No, no, yeah, right. of course. <laughs> you're working for no, someone no, no. else. They're paying the bill, and you're wasting time. My point being, also, you don't know what you don't know, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, might think, hey, there's nothing wrong. I can go ahead and do this in here. And if you had a five minute conversation with someone like Tank Isaias or Maestri or whoever that has worked a lot with different database structures, and you explain to them, and they might say. Well, you realize, you know, when you go to do this, it's going to break and it may not happen for the first three months of your development, right? Like, I'm just saying, I would check with an expert, you know, if you know someone that has worked in it, yeah. just run it by them, right? Like, even make your decision first and then go to them and say, 
This is what I'm planning on doing. Do you have any reason why I shouldn't do this? Because yeah, what what might, what might make it hard for me in the future? <laughs> well, I, I guess so. I, I guess my 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 statement had more to do with folks who are just trying to learn, sure. not not people who oh, are right. trying to just learn to code to code for somebody. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Just because at the end of the day, once you learn the basic concepts of one language, one yeah. structure. Um, it translates easily into the next one. Yeah. Well, and, and, the, and, the the point, and the point is to learn the methodology and the way of thinking and yep. then build your skill set around that. Yep. Well, and take, I would add on to that and just look at Studio, which I don't know what Chad's demonstrating other than the database, but he learned so much about programming because he was building a studio. Right. It wasn't his goal to learn necessarily auto hotkey and every ins and out of the stuff. No, but that's right. By doing having an example to work through, he learned a crazy amount of stuff, you know, and that's how I think we all pick a project, start working on it and dive deep. And yeah, you learn a lot of stuff by focusing. Until yep. you start hitting those roadblocks. When you start hitting the roadblocks is when you start learning something new until you hit a point there it says well the language cannot do that anymore then you have to pick up a different thing that will do what you're looking for it's usually that's usually the same path that i took uh on learning so what i'm seeing that he's doing is he's creating a table and then he's adding some values well he already added the values on it and then he's going ahead and using sql down there to kind of like show them show the 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 data that had been stored already based on some conditions um yeah so he's just going ahead and chad do you have anything to add to that no not really i was just goofing around <laughs> <laughs> there it goes and, and the other one which i've you know you all i'm sure have seen at least some videos from me at some point i will sit for hours while I'm paying someone to do the code and I'll still watch. And then I'll see, I'll go, what, what the hell was it? Like, I can't tell you how many times between the two of those guys, I've been like, what the hell did you, and we'll take a 30 minute detour because they'll explain the concept where I'm like, why, why? did you do that? Yeah. I, I'm... <laughs> and you leapfrog, like you learn so much more when you're watching someone else that's above you. And, uh... you know, you don't have to sit here and just only stare at it, but you know, I keep watching it and I'm like, why did you do that? Um, and right. <laughs> that happened to me recently. I, we were developing this thing. I haven't shown you, Joe, by the way. Uh, this this little pop-up that would fade away when the mouse is moving away from the thing. And just by doing that, I was I learned so many details about this finding the correct location of the mouse on the screen of the screen in relation to the window that you're actually looking at um again i had never dealt with that i had to learn a few things and i'm not really good at math in many areas and as soon as i started developing that then i saw like oh man that is interesting that is so quick so so, so cool so yeah. uh, it's so, as you say, just grabbing a project, starting on it, see what happens. You don't know, then go ahead and try to find out. That's what it goes. Yeah. And, and I want to build on what you just said there, Isaiah. I, I think there's some sort of um, misconception amongst people just trying to start out that, that somehow people like you or me or Joe or Maestro, they just know everything, right? We don't. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> We are still fumbling around in the dark. Have no idea. Yeah. All these years, just like you. The difference is, is we gained the skills of knowing where to look now. Yeah, that's that's so, basically it. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not that we know everything. It will, and and actually, let me second onto that tank in the sense to say. This is one of the reasons why I have no problem saying, what the hell did you, I don't know that, like, look, there's knowledge and there's being intelligent. I'm, I'm pretty damn smart, but I'm not very knowledgeable as a programmer, right? Yeah. But there's a huge difference. Don't be embarrassed when you don't know something, because like you said, it take, at some point, we all were at that starting point and we all have evolved up, right? I mean, right. 
Yeah, uh, I, I was very surprised one time you said like, hey, let, let me do an interview with you. And then in the video said like, interviewing an expert. And I was like, who's the expert? Like me? <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, what? Who, who, me? Like, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't know about this thing. <laughs> how many people that I would say, hey, let's do a, an interview with that, you know, an auto hockey guru or whatever. Uh -huh. People are like, that's not me. I'm like, trust me, you're, you're fine, man. Like, you know, yeah. I'm like, no, who, yeah. me? No I, way. I, I can't tell you how many job interviews I, I've had where I ended up landing the job where somebody asked me something, right? And, and I'm an expert in a number of uh, technologies. I, I am. Um, but um, I, am, I am really quick to pull the trigger on, you know, I just try to Google it and see if somebody else has done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. You just go ahead and check if somebody else has done that. You know, I don't know. Nobody does. And if somebody tells you they know everything, right? Yeah, that's when way. you start. Yeah, that's when you start just saying well, like, hmm. honestly. So here, as a, as an employer, right? Who the last thing I want is to be paying someone to work to figure out on their own when you can Google it and find an example where someone else has solved it for you, and then you make minor tweaks, right? Like. Yeah. It's, I wouldn't want to be paying someone because it's costly. It takes time to learn. Now, I, I would definitely, uh, even though I agree with the main idea on that, I have to mention a little caveat there. When you're getting information from the internet, if you do not really understand it, what might happen, even though you solve the issue right away, but what might happen is that later on, some issues might arise that you will have no way of solving it. And this happened to me one time that I just used a library, uh, I think it had to do with Windsock or whatever, something was happening with the library that I could not understand. And I had to scrap the whole library and do something else, just because I couldn't understand it, and I couldn't actually fix it. So technically, I wasted time, even though at the beginning, it was so easy, I just found it, put it, use it, everything was good. In real life, then it started having issues and I couldn't figure it out because that was not my library. That was not something that I knew. And I was not comfortable with it. And I didn't know how to fix it. So even though I do agree, it's better to not reinvent the wheel. Be careful when you grab code. If you don't understand that, you might be creating a problem for yourself without knowing. You know, that might be a, Which, a caveat that you have to keep in mind. We didn't yeah. mention that earlier on the editors, but, um, you know, anything that you use, looking at how active it is the developer is working on it that you know that's another really critical thing that oh, yeah. in, in the account yep that's right in yeah. case that i could just talk directly to them about the issue and they can actually give me feedback recently mm -hmm. i i am very involved in in the lexer for auto hotkey version too because i like it and every time there's a little bit of an issue i talk to the developer and right now i'm talking to the developer of the lexer and lexicos and both are talking about a very specific thing so if the development of that thing is there you can have the discussion ask questions why doesn't this work what is going on how can we solve it if you don't have that you are on your own that library is out there and you have to fix it yourself because the guy that knows is not there you know so keep those things in mind whenever you're using libraries in general yeah yeah uh, that's one of the great things about auto hotkey is there is a vi very vibrant uh inter support community to it um and and there's not a lot of elitism in that Right. Uh, you know, um, because the, the 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 ones that have manifested over time that have tried to act like they were some sort of elitists, they, they didn't last long because they got <laughs> they got pushed away. <laughs> now, I wanted to take a few minutes before we we finish, and I wanted to answer one question that I saw it. Uh, somebody mentioned something at the beginning. Um, there is no right answer to that. So I'm just going to share my, the way how I do it and see if that makes sense to you. Um, somebody was asking, okay, so how do you organize your projects whenever you're working without a hotkey? Do you have a way of working? And yes, I do. So let me, I don't know if, uh, chat, are you, do you want to continue sharing that or do you want, can I share the screen for oh, a minute? Good. Okay, cool. Let me just show um, whenever I have this uh, function, I created a little bit of a, of a 
Hey, Isaiah, hold on one second. I'm going to stop the recording and restart it here. So, yep.